Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day to all those fathers in the crowd, or if you're watching online, would you please stand as we begin our time of worship? As you do that, I'm going to read this scripture. It comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, and the things in heaven, and the things in earth, and the things underneath the earth. Join with me this morning singing about that beautiful name, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. What a 
with love and grace and dry the tear of some small space did I drink the sunlight in and look on losing as a win did I take the highest road did I repay the debt I owe Search me, search me now, I pray, and wash my every sin away. Before the purple sunset skies, before the carpet. Before I reach the end of day, I've got to know I walked your way before the darkness shades the ground, before the sun goes down. Did I keep my word today? Shit. 
shades the ground before the sun goes down. Yeah, when the cat's out, the mice will play, right? So you can't do nothing to me because you're in Florida, so <laughs> take that one. You can deal with me when you get back. Hopefully you'll forget about it. All right, no, but uh, it was a odd morning this morning already. My phone, when I got here, started blowing up, and then I turned it off because I was done with it. <laughs> Just uh, kids' sports. You know, things can get crazy in the morning when they like that. When it rains, they change the schedule and they don't always tell you. But it's good. It's good. Got to take care. But no, uh, Greg told a, a couple of dad jokes. I like to tell dad jokes too. Sometimes he laughs. Really? The boys would uh, attest to the fact that all my jokes are pretty much dad jokes. Is that good? True? True. You guys got to stay awake or I'm going uh, to call you out. You got to laugh at all my jokes too or you're walking to lunch. Not really, but. All right, I do have a couple dad jokes though because you know it's Father's Day. I got the mic and I can tell a few dad jokes. So we're going to tell a few dad jokes. Let's see. Uh, why do you... Uh, what do you call it when Batman skips church? Christian Bale. For those of you who don't know, he was one of the Batmans. Sorry. You know, uh, you know we had a, uh, another theologian last week, so I'm going to drop this one on you too. Uh, why does Snoop Dogg always carry an umbrella? Faux drizzle. Hey, see, these aren't even mine. I got these off the internet. Mine are actually good. Not really, but we'll just go with that. What do you call an illegally parked frog? Toad. Where do baby cats learn to swim? I expected the lifeguards to know this one. The kiddie pool. He got it, it just took him a while. Why, why wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't buy anything with Velcro, it's totally ripped off. Can February, March? No, but April, May. I got two more and we'll digress. Actually, we'll hopefully get better. Uh, do you, did you hear about the circus fire? It was intense. It's inappropriate to date, make a dad joke if you're not a, a dad. It's a faux pas. <laughs> Jody liked that one. None of the rest of you did, Jody got it, so take that one. All right, go ahead, pop it up, Jody. <laughs> Today we're gonna talk about seven ways to be a better dad. Originally had it on there, seven ways to be a good dad, um, but hopefully most of us are Kind of good, but so I wanted to uh, go with more of a, hey, let's try to, how can we be better, uh, better dad? Um, hopefully none of us have completely messed our kids' lives up yet, uh, even if they're grown, uh, <laughs> but how can we be better? Because you can always be better as they're living in your house, if they come back to your house, and when they're gone for good, uh, you can still be a better dad. So this applies to all dads of all, all shapes, sizes, ages, whatever. But it also doesn't just apply to dads. It also applies to uh, moms and ladies um, because most of these things kind of interconnect. Um, things that what we're going to talk about 
uh, go with the dad, and they also go with the, the mom. They also kind of interconnect, because obviously it takes uh, both of us to raise our children, because if it was just me, um, my kids might be even more messed up than what they are. And if it was just Becky, um, the boys would be really tired because they'd be doing all the, the work around the house. And uh, <laughs> but we're both, we're obviously both needed. Go ahead and uh, the first thing that we can um, do is use words to encourage your children. Use words to encourage your children. Go ahead, flip to the next one. Why should we encourage them? Encouragement can provide them with strength to look ahead, move forward, and reach for the next goal. You know, a lot, go ahead in the next one because it's, we're going to get, we'll stop when we get to the next point. Why should we encourage them? The words you speak to and about your children can either build them up or tear them down. I believe I have yet one more. So turn in First Thessalonians 5.11 if you want. If not, if you can read it, if you brought your spectacles, I think I made it big enough for everybody. But we'll read this uh, passage real quick. First Thessalonians 5.11. It says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So they're being told to edify one another as they already do it. So they're already edifying one another, but it's a reminder, hey, we need to edify. We need to do this more. And the point above this uh, passage is how many words that you spoke this week were instructive or encouraging. It is really easy to focus on the negative things that your children do. It's really easy. Um, I know it was really easy for me. It was really easy for Phil when he was growing up. Miss Loretta, you would agree with that because you were the perfect one and he was the one always getting in trouble. Um, so you probably heard him getting in trouble and you were just getting encouraged all the time. I'd like to see what Facebook's saying right now if he's watching. <laughs> but it's really easy for us to focus on those things because when your kids mess up, it's really easy to say something about that. You know, it's, it's really e easy for that. But when they do something right or do something good, a lot of times it gets ignored um, for the simple factor like, finally they did it. You know, or if, you, you know, if you're always harping on them for cleaning the room and they finally clean the room without you telling them or they actually clean it when you tell them, you don't always tell them, hey, that's a good job. You know, you did a good job. You actually did it the way mom wants you to have it done, not the way that I'm kind of okay with. You know, you did it right. You know, there's not the words of encouragement for that when they do things right. You know, when they get good grades in school, a lot of times it's like, well, that's what they're supposed to do, so you might just look over that. But when they mess up, yeah, we let them know about that. You know, or when they, when they turn in their assignments and you see, uh, because we can look at everything online, when they turn in their assignments and they do everything the way they're supposed to, it's not, hey, good job, you know, you did what you're supposed to do. It's when you see the one that they forgot to turn in for whatever reason, really? Were you just too lazy to do it? You know, we get on them for those things. And because it's easy. But it, 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 in reality, it should be just as easy for us to encourage our children. Do they need to be corrected? Do they need to be disciplined? Do they need to have words of instruction? Oh, yeah, they do. Did I need that? Oh, yeah, I do. Do I still need that? Oh, yeah, I still need that. But how many of you like to be encouraged? I'd say all of us like to be encouraged. How many of you, when you mess up at work, or whatever you might be doing, like it when you get beat down. Now, typically, what do you do? You raise the defense mode. How many of you like it when your teenagers raise the defense mode? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Some of that is the fact that they're teenagers. Some of that could it be the fact that we're not encouraging them more than what we actually should be and trying to help them get through situations when they mess up instead of just beating them down. Hopefully we're encouraging our children and not just correcting them. If not, I say let's try it. If you are, try encouraging them more. Just try to be an encouragement. 
And in here in this passage in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, the Bible, uh, they're speaking to the church of Thessalonica, and it says that edify one another, even as also ye do. So they were already edifying each other, but what did, what did he remind them to do? To keep doing it, to do it more. Do we need to only edify? No. There needs to be correction. But there needs to be edification also. So when they mess up, let them know. But let them know when they do things right. You know, same thing if you're a dad or just uh, obviously uh, if you're if you're the uh, the dad, you can edify everybody in the household. If you're a mom, you can. This obviously applies to you too. Not saying you're the one who's always screaming because that's not always the case. Sometimes it's a dad. Sometimes it's mom. Sometimes it's none of you. And sometimes we just you know the little teapot we get going and we end up pouring out and unfortunately it's a lot of times it's on our kids and so we just need to make sure that we are edify if we're not edifying edify if you are edifying your children try doing a little bit more you know maybe take a, a good spin on that correction and make it to where it's got a little sugar in it and not so much venom you know that venom hurts and it kills but that sugar makes the medicine go down a little easier and so try to make it maybe a little bit nicer when you when you're doing that correction and and, and build them up as you go so the first thing we can do to uh, the, try to be a better a better dad a better parent whatever it might be is to try to edify and encourage our children more the, th the second thing we can do is model the person you want your kids to become we can model the person we want our kids to become values are caught not just taught. You know, I can teach my kids all the values that I, that I want. I can read them the Bible. I can, I can um, read them Christian principles. I can even make them memorize Christian principles. Um, I remember when I was in school, we went through Bob Jones' Bible for a while, and they had uh, catechisms in there, which I always, always thought it was funny because that's what the Catholics have, but we made it they were all Baptist catechisms, but it was just weird. Uh, <laughs> they were all good. They were all Bible-based. They just called them catechisms and whatever. I, I digress there for a minute. But, you know, we can even teach them those, like, those principles and things like that. But how do, how do, some kids learn that way by being taught. But the majority of people, things stick when it's observed and actually done. Good example. How many of you are good on computers? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are not good on computers? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you know somebody who is good on computers? How many of you, when you have an issue, either call and ask that person to come over, or you call them, FaceTime them, whatever you can do, and to get information from them? All right. How many of you like it when, make sure this isn't, say this to the mouse, they go, this is how you do it. Click, 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 and then you click here, then you click here, then you click there, click there. Okay, that's it. Yeah, nobody likes that. You're like, how did you do that? Can you write it down? Can you make pictures of it? Can you do something? It's, it's easy. You just click here, you click there, and then it's there. Well, how did you get it there? Okay, well, let me, let me do it, let me try it. And then they get frustrated at you. You're like, okay, I think it's here. Ooh. Do you want to delete everything on your computer? <laughs> sure. No, you can't do that, you know? It, but if, if they take the time and let you do it, and they, and they let you mess up a little bit sometimes, or, you know, if, if you're trying to teach somebody how to change a tire, I can, I, can, I can tell you how to do it. We can watch YouTube videos on it. But until you actually do it, physically do it, you're not going to remember how to do it. You know? The last time I got a flat, it's awesome, you know? I, I had got a flat, I think, in the car I drive one other time but it had been a long time ago. 
And I'm, I'm took everything out of the back of the car, got all the baseball gear in there, you know, looks like I'm moving, you know, I'm at the gas station taking everything out. And then I'm trying to open up, cause I know where the spare tire is and I'm trying, there's a handle, I'm trying to open it up. And it won't, like it, it keeps opening and it's like, well, it's like the little thing where you put your groceries. Like I know it's under here, but I can't figure out how to, like it even opens a little bit. Like, I couldn't remember cause it had been so long. So I had to YouTube it. And I felt like an idiot there in the gas station pulling up YouTube. The guy next to me is like, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Like, I didn't want to tell him. I didn't know how to get the spare out of my car. He probably knew, but I'm not about to tell him. So I YouTube it. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. You got to lift it from the, the backside and pull it out. And then you get it out, and then you start doing everything that you need to do to get it off and on and all that stuff. But it had been a, I knew how to do it, but it had been a while. So then I had to be reminded of how I was supposed to do it. I had to be retaught how to do it. And then once I got it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. So I pulled it out and then I knew how to change a tire, unfortunately, cause that's happened. I was just glad it wasn't on the side of the highway cause that's never fun. Um, got it all done, got the donut on, got home. And then of course it snowed four inches that night and I didn't have time to get it fixed. So you know what I did? I drove all the way back to work on the donut with four inches of snow, how smart was that? But they get it fixed. So we got, we were good. We were safe, but values are caught. They're not just taught. They need to be taught so that they, and then they need to be seen so that they, and, and, and visualize so they can actually be caught. So you know what to do it. And then sometimes you got to reteach them because they forgot. And that's a lot of times where we, where we get into the, uh, the discipline factor, sometimes they need it, um, but sometimes it's not given necessarily in the right way because you're like, I've already taught them. We've done this before. Another example, I'm gonna use my kids. I probably haven't never told them this one. But years ago, they went to a baseball camp and, and I, I was excited that they were able to go. It was a good school that had a good program. They come back and I'm like, all right guys, what kind of drills did you learn? What did you? I mean, what other things did you learn when you were there? And they started repeat, telling me all these things that they had learned and all these new drills that they had done. And when they got done, I told Becky, um, is it just me? And she's like, no, those are all things that they've already been taught. Those are already things that they've learned. But now for whatever reason, it clicked. So when that happened, I could have been in two things. I could have been mad because the, the things that I taught them didn't click, or I could have just been glad that it finally clicked. And I took the, not necessarily trying to brag on myself, but I was more excited the fact that it finally clicked. Was it me that taught them? Yeah, I taught them. Did they observe it? And could they have caught it from me? Yeah, oh yeah, they could have but it took somebody else to teach them and it took somebody else for them to actually catch it but it finally stuck and sometimes that it, that's the way it is with the things of god with your children you can teach them you can live it but sometimes it takes somebody else in their life to make it finally click and, and that's the frustrating part as a parent because you want them to get it earlier than what they've got it. But sometimes it takes a little, somebody else to say it in just a little different way for it to click. And that's one reason why we need to surround them with people in their lives that are godly people so that hopefully if, if something that you want them to learn from the word of God doesn't get in there, somebody else, it'll click from them. Or maybe something that you forgot to teach them. Somebody else comes along and they teach them and it finally it gets in there and it gets deep and they, and they catch it. Children often pick up character values from what they see us do more than what we tell them to do. You know that, that old, old adage, you know, uh, when people tell you that there's always somebody watching you and you never believe it? Especially when you're like in junior high or high school and people, are, your parents or your youth leader might say, you know, there's always somebody watching you. 
There's always somebody looking at you. There's always somebody trying to see what you're doing that looks up to you. And you're like, you're full of it. Especially when you're in junior high or high school. You're like, there's no way. There's no way somebody's looking at me. Well, how many of you, if you can remember that far back or just remember, when you were in elementary school, I remember some things, not everything. My mom wishes I remembered more. Uh, but, <laughs> but I remember sitting in the gymnasium and, and watching the, the varsity basketball team. They looked huge. Now, I was a little guy, but that's okay. They were huge. And you watch them play, and they looked like the best basketball players ever. They looked to, to me like the NBA all-star team. They were nowhere near it. But to me, they were. And you watch them. You know what? And some of them probably had good attitudes. Some of them probably had bad attitudes. Some of them fouled more than others that fouled. Some of them hustled more than others hustled. But I was watching them. Some of them I knew their names. Some of them I didn't know who they were, but I'm like, man, they're good. They're huge. Do you think any of those guys on the court realized that all those elementary kids that were sitting in the stands were actually watching them sometimes? Watching their attitudes, watching their behavior? They have a clue. Our children are watching us. Sometimes we don't even have a clue they're watching us. Sometimes you don't have a clue because you can see that there's no change, there's no reaction to how they're watching you. One of my uh, kids, when they were younger, they just watched everything. And now that they're a little older, they'll be, wa they'll be sometimes not even paying attention. And uh, children's church uh, teachers could be, would probably attest to this, that sometimes they're, they're, they don't always have eye contact, but they're paying attention. They don't look like they're paying attention. But you ask them a question about what you just taught, they know. So even when you don't think they're paying attention, they're paying attention to it. So they're picking up character values from what they see in, in us more than what we tell them. So if you're telling them to read your Bible and that it's important, if you're telling them that it's important to do this, it's important to have a good attitude, it's important to be nice, it's important to be kind, it's important to be a person of integrity, do they see that in you? They hear it, do they see it in you? If they were to come to your job, would they see the same person they see at home that they, you, they would see at work? They might because you change your behavior when your kid comes to work with you. And then the guys at work are like, dude, like, trying to act good because your kid's here, you know, or whatever it is. Are you the same no matter where you are? Can the kids see the things that are different? Who are we imitating more? Our father? Because that's how I learned how to be a dad, by watching my father. Or are we learning from our heavenly father? 1 Corinthians 11 once says, be followers of me even as I also of Christ. Apostle Paul telling them to be followers of him because he's a follower of Christ. So you need to follow him as long as he's following Christ. And if he ever errs from following Christ, then we need to make sure that we follow Christ. As being a father, you know, there's some areas that your father probably made some mistakes. And sometimes we don't cut him any slack for making those mistakes. But we like to get slack cut for us when we make mistakes. So when your father made mistakes grow, uh, with you growing up, cut him some slack. Forgive them for those things. I don't know how bad those things might be in your life. It's as, it could be just as easy as saying, Father, I forgive you. For, and you get a big old list. Or it could be a small list. There could be a lot of hurt. There could be a lot of pain there. We need to get that forgiveness there. 
but as we're imitating and modeling somebody for our children, yes, it should, we should hopefully be able to have a Christian father example. But even if you don't, we always have our Heavenly Father that we can mimic, that we can get into the Word. We can find things. This is how my Heavenly Father reacted in this situation with the children of Israel giving grace over and over and over and over again, even though they didn't deserve it. You know, with, with, with us, you know, with the, with the whole world, you know, being willing to give his own son to pay the debt for our sin, sacrificing everything, the most important thing that he had for us. We need to make sure that we're imitating our heavenly father more than just our earthly father. Go ahead to the next one. Show your kids how to spend time with God. Have you taught them how to study God's word? You say they're too young. Not necessarily. I remember as the kids were real little getting the, the big picture Bible book and just picking a story to read in there. You know, it might have been three or four pages and they're looking at pictures. And some of it, you know, kind of accurate, kind of not. You never know, depending on which Bible <laughs> the kid's book you got. But showing them the importance of looking and reading the word of God and actually doing it with them. Another thing is it's more about is it being caught or is it being taught? Do you have a quiet time with God? If you don't have a quiet time with God, how would you expect your children to have that same quiet time? Has it been a while since you've been in that secret place with your Heavenly Father? Has, has there been you know, some drifting from your heavenly father if if right now the only way if 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 your walk with god was would, would be transferred the way you have it now to the, your children the way your children would have a walk with god would you be okay with that is it something that would be pleasing to god are we are we allowing it to be caught and not just taught with our quiet time with God. Not saying we need to, you know, make sure we get up in the morning and have our quiet time, you know, and be like, stop, I'm having my quiet time, you know, this is a sign, I'm reading my Bible, I'm studying it. But they're gonna walk in on it at times. You know, you, you hear the multiple stories of, of, of children, you know, the, their parent tried to have their quiet time in a secret place and say it was their bedroom and for whatever reason that day that the door didn't get shut all the way and you see that you hear the stories of little children that they solve just through the crack that mom or dad was sitting there on their knees praying or mom and dad were sitting there reading their, they're reading their bible getting something from god and they hear they stick that around and hear for a little uh, listen for a little while and they hear their father pray for them they hear maybe their mother pray for them. Do we do it so that they can maybe catch us? No. We do it because we love them and we care for them. And we need that quiet time with God. So do you have a quiet time with God? Remember, values are caught, not just taught. The fourth thing is be the kind of man you want your daughter to marry or someone else's daughter to marry if you don't have daughters. Some, some things that are in here. A close relationship with Christ. All fathers should have a close relationship with Christ. And this is something that I want my, my sons to see. This is something I want my daughters to see. That I have a close relationship with Christ. The second thing, and these aren't, the first one's obviously the most important. The rest of them aren't necessarily any particular order. But a hard worker. If you have a daughter, do you want your daughter to date, possibly marry somebody who's a lazy bum? No, because you don't want to spend your retirement money <laughs> writing checks to your daughter the rest of her life because her husband's a lazy bum and doesn't want to work. You don't want to do that. You know, you want to be able to go play golf, you know, or go tour some uh, Major League Baseball stadiums because you got free time, you know, or whatever it might be. You want them to be a hard worker. You want them to sacrifice for their family. 
You know, you hear all the time about moms sacrificing for their family. That's why their wardrobe is from the 1990s, which is great now because it's back. <laughs> all right, if you were a teenager or college age in the 90s and your clothes still fit and you still got them, you've been sacrificing for years and now you can bring them back out of the closet, you know? <laughs> They're in style again. But you hear all the time about moms sacrificing for their families. A lot of times when you hear, you don't hear dads sacrificing for their family. Sometimes you hear of them sacrificing for their family and you never see them because they're always off working. Sometimes it's because you need the money. Sometimes it's because you need the money to keep up with the Joneses. I don't think we have any Joneses. If you do, I'm sorry. Uh, we can't keep up with you. <laughs> but sometimes we get ourselves in a pickle because we need more money because we've overextended ourselves and so that's why sometimes you sacrifice for your family but we need to make sure that we're making sacrifices not just monetarily but making sacrifices instead of you know I could still might be able to play softball still I don't know I could still do that I definitely can still umpire there's a lot of other things that I enjoy doing. I enjoy a lots of different things, but I can't do all those things and still be a dad to my, my kids because I just don't have the amount of time. If you were to look at my schedule some weeks, you'd wonder how we have time to do some of the things that we actually do do. Um, but we need to make sure that we're sacrificing for our family. If we're, we need, another thing is we need to put others ahead of the, ourselves. My wife's needs should be more important than mine, for me. I hope she feels the same way about me. You say, well, how are you guys ever going to figure it out? That's why when you're driving to get lunch, nobody ever makes a decision. It's true, you know, because I'm trying to put her needs ahead of mine, and she's trying to put my needs ahead of her, you know, it's, we're just being scriptural. And finally, we just got to make a decision and say, I'm going where I want to go. No, I'm just, Somebody does, I just say you're driving, so if she's driving, you know, you gotta pick it. But we need to make sure we put others ahead of ourselves. You know, our children sometimes need to be put above some of our needs that we might have. Not that we're neglecting ourselves, because we do need to care for ourselves, but we need to put others above ourselves. We need to be kind, we need to be loving, and we need to be patient. These are things that we need to mirror to our children especially our daughters, so that they don't end up with some bum. And for our sons, so that they know how to act, so that hopefully they can get a good godly wife someday. Because a good godly wife doesn't want a bum for a husband. I don't know how Becky got me, but we'll keep going. Uh, <laughs> sympathy. If you have a daughter, treat her the way you would want her to be treated by her husband someday. Treat her with respect. She, it should be hard for her husband for a little while because she doesn't measure up to dad. But as that's why I would assume, I don't know yet, but that's why I would assume when the father of the bride walks down the aisle and says, who gives? this uh, woman and he says her mother and I and that's why I would say it's probably hard because he's been the only man for her for so long the one that met her needs that cared for her, that took care of her that, that was kind, that was loving that was the Christian example and now he's passing off to somebody that he trusts but is he going to be as good as me? <laughs> you don't know, you know say, well, some of you do. <laughs> but it's hard. But we need to treat them that way. If you don't have a daughter, show your sons how to treat his wife by how you treat your wife. And that'll help. Go ahead to the next one. Become a better father. You don't want bitterness and resentment to develop between you and your children. Many times they won't be open with you if there is a lingering unforgiveness. Go ahead, the 
Sometimes after prayer and much frustration, you don't know how to heal a relationship with a child. And we'll st hold there for a second. Sometimes as a father, you miss things. That's why God wanted you to have a husband and a wife, because sometimes the dad misses things. When, when, when you know there's a barrier between you and a child, what can we do? Pray, obviously, is the first thing. Ask God to give you wisdom. And if you can't figure it out, talk to your wife about it. Like, hey, what's going on with kid two? Or kid one? Or whatever it might be. What's going on with them that I might be missing? They might have already known it. They've just been quiet about it because they wanted you to be able to work it out, but you're asking for help. If the two of you are lost and you don't have a clue, ask your child. Now you don't necessarily do this when they're like, one, you're not gonna get very productive, you know? But ask them, go to the next slide. You can go to them, especially this happens, I would think, more when they get older. Go to them and say, I wanna be a better father to you and I need your help. What are the things that I've done that hurt you? Because you know there's bitterness there, but you're not sure what you did. What, was it your tone? Was it something that you took away that meant a lot to them, that you had no clue meant a lot to them? And when you ask them, what are the things that I've done that hurt you? Tell them I want to know so I can ask for forgiveness. Will they tell you? They're teenagers, they might. You might have to come back to them in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. They might come to you in a couple of weeks. But whenever they open up to you, it's time to listen. When they start saying what's the hurt that they have, it's not time for you to defend your position. You've come to them and you'd ask them, I need your help. I want to be a better parent to you. How have I hurt you? I want to ask forgiveness for the way that I've hurt you. Let them share it. And then when it's done, go to the next one, please. You apologize for the things that you, the ways you've hurt them. What are some things I could do to show you how much I love you is something else that you can ask. Obviously, if you feel like you're disconnected from a child, especially when they get older, more so when they're out of the house, they might feel, you might feel disconnected that you don't know how to show that daily love because you're not there with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And you feel like you're disconnected from your child maybe, whether they're younger or older. Go up to them and ask them, how can I show you how much, how I can, how I can show you how I love you? And if they're open with you, take notes. Literally, get out a piece of paper and a pen and take notes. Don't do it on your phone because they might think you're texting somebody even if you go to the notes section. Actually get it out and write it down. And then don't do it all at once, but start following through with some of those things. You know, if it's, a, if it's your daughter and she would just want you to tell her how she looks nice today a little bit more. Because you've noticed that she looked nice, but you maybe didn't give her that admiration that she needed. And start doing it. If she asks you if she looks fat in it, don't tell her yes. That's, that's a dad point, because you, you can't do that. It's mom's job. <laughs> First Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That doesn't just provide, uh, can, can go towards your Christian life, but it also goes to your parenting, which should be a part of your Christian life. You can't just go into being a parent and be like, I'm going to wing it. You might feel like you're winging it, even if you're prepared and you're ready, but you need to do it to the glory of God. You know, we tell our kids when they're in school, when they're struggling or in their, if they're on their sports team and they're maybe not trying as hard as they should. Why, if you're going to be on this team, if you're going to be in school because you have to be, you need to do it to the glory of God. And that's the way we should parent, for the glory of God. Love your wife in front of your kids. And this is where all the kids are like, gross. But children need to know that their parents still actually love each other. And hopefully it is a love that has grown as the years have passed by. 
You need to tell your wife or your husband that you love them. You know, kiss them every once in a while in front of your kids. Don't get gross about it, but kiss them. You know, they need to know that mom and dad love each other. This love gives them security, especially in today's world with so many divorces going on. Your children need to know that you love each other. Their friends at school, whether it's a Christian school or whether it's a public school, are going through divorces. It happens. Unfortunately, it happens. They don't, if they feel like you guys are always fighting, you're always fussing, they're listening to their friends that are going through a divorce that are hearing that their parents are always fussing and fighting, so what do you think they're thinking? Am I next? Do my parents not love me? Do my, are my parents, do they hate each other? Are, 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 am I going to have to move? They're thinking these things. You say, no, they're not. Good chance they are if they got a friend that's going through that same situation. This love that we show them gives them security. Discover the father you have always wanted. Last one here. It doesn't matter how good a father you have had. He wasn't perfect. He failed you sometimes. He let you down. He wasn't the best example of how to be a good father. Go ahead, didn't it? There's one that is perfect, one that's never failed you, one that has never let you down, one that's a perfect example. It's our Heavenly Father. And if we spend more time with Him, we'll be able to have, to be able to be a better father that we need to be. Go ahead, we're going to scroll through the last few just real quick. Seven ways to be a dad, a better dad. Use words to encourage your children. Model the person you want your kids to become. Show your kids how to spend time with God. Be the kind of man you want or your or someone else's daughter to marry. Become a better father. Make that choice. Love your li- wife in front of your kids. And discover the father you've always wanted. These are just seven ways that you can become a better dad. There's obviously thousands of ways that each of us can become a better dad. But ultimately, it comes down to us choosing to do everything we do for the glory of God. Where do you stand at this point? If the musicians would come, we'll have a time of invitation, and you can go ahead and, and, and stand. I don't know where the, the, the word of God puts put you today. I don't know where you are on where you are for being a dad. I don't know if you have resentment towards your father. Hopefully you don't. If you do, make things right before you can't make them right. Because if they go to their grave, you don't want to go to their graveside with that resentment. If your father's still here and you appreciate him, make sure that they know it. If your kids are still here, make sure that they know that you love them. I'll never forget when my uncle passed with cancer and we buried him. My grandfather said, this isn't right. I shouldn't be burying my son. And did he have some things that he wanted to teach his son and some more years he wanted with him? I'm sure he did. Don't have any regrets on how you live your life and how you are the parent that God wants you to be. We'll bow our heads and close our eyes just for a minute. Think about it. Where, how, what is my relationship with my children? Is it pleasing to my Heavenly Father? What is my relationship with my Father? Is it what it should be? Maybe you need to go to your Father and just ask and, and forgive Him for all the things that you have resentment towards Him. He may not even know that he wronged you that way. He might know, though also. But you releasing that forgiveness will give freedom to your soul. And that bitterness won't be there anymore. If you have a good father, thank him for it. If you don't, you always have a good heavenly father. He's always there for you. He's always there with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house with your people. Lord, we thank you for our dads and what they mean to us. 
We thank you most importantly, though, for you and the example you gave us, the perfect example. The bar set so high that we won't be able to achieve what you have given to us, but you give us an example of how to get better every day and be the parent that you want us to be. Father, we thank you for this time together with friends and family. Lord, I pray that you will help me to be the father that I need to be and the example I need to be. And Lord, I pray that you'll help all the others in, the, in attendance today to also be there also. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Remember before you're dismissed that we do have service tonight at 5. Uh, you have Greg and all of his dad jokes that you can look forward to. Or loathe, either way, there will be at least one that's funny. So make sure you come back tonight and enjoy that. And also get fed from the Word of God and be able to join together with fellow believers and get encouraged. Uh, with that, hopefully it stays nice outside and you can enjoy Father's Day. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>